Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an early edition of the Mike the New Haven podcast, episode 136. I appreciate all you being here. Hopefully, you're getting up and enjoying a nice coffee today. If you're on the East Coast, you're snowed in. So even all the more reason to come and check out the show today on this fine Friday morning. So if you haven't checked out the previous two episodes, yesterday was a really fun show. It was with Alex Dennis, former anchor and reporter on WCBS in New York. She's out in Nashville now, Emmy Award winning anchor and reporter. A lot of fun to talk to, just a very sweet person. And the previous episode was episode 134, volume nine of the Mike the New Haven miniseries, the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. That was Mike Milner, who my next guest worked with uh, quite a bit back in the day. And who is my next guest? Well, he's a 40 year veteran of the New York City Fire Department. Joined the bravest in 1980. His career began with some of the best firefighters in the history of the city have been bred, and that is the borough of Brooklyn, where there is a lot of fire as my next guest well knows cited six times throughout his career for bravery he's a 2010 graduate of the naval postgraduate school center for homeland defense and security where he earned a master of arts degree in security studies he received an undergraduate degree as well at suny empire state college and has also attended both the fdny's advanced leadership course in 2015 and fire officers management institute excuse me in 2009 and the combating terrorism center at west point in 2006 all of which has served him well for his current role as chief of the department of the FDNY, and that is Thomas Richardson, who joins us now, with volume 10 of the Best of the Bravest, interviews with the FDNY's elite chief. This is a pleasure. Welcome. How are you? Good morning, Mike. Thank you for having me. Uh, no problem. Thank you for being here. So the first question is one I ask all my guests your early years. Where'd you grow up? I grew up out on Long Island in a town called Deer Park, Suffolk County, Western Suffolk County. Uh, my parents moved there when I was three years old from Brooklyn. So I was the oldest of five children. So they moved out there in 1962, and I still live there. I still live in Deer Park. I raised my three children there. They're all grown and married now. And uh, my wife and I uh, have the empty nest syndrome. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm the only one that's left here in, in my house. So my mom will have that feeling in a couple years, too, <laughs> when, I, when, I, uh, when I split, you know. so. But it's it's interesting growing up in Deer Park. There, so, there was, you know, it was joked about in the uh, – obituary for the late Joseph Vigiano, an NYPD emergency services detective killed on 9-11. Him and his brother, who was a firefighter, John, also died that day. They were from Deer Park. And the New York Times mentioned that obituary for Joe, that there seemed to be a civil service bug emanating throughout uh, Deer Park in the 70s and 80s. So I imagine in an environment where there's so many guys who are volunteers or are cops or firemen in the city, it made your career path a little bit easier to choose. Absolutely. So I know the Vigianos well. Their dad, Captain John Vigiano, uh, who has passed about three and a half years ago, uh, he was one of my senior mentors. And uh, John was always looking out for me throughout my career. But I got my start as a firefighter, as a volunteer in Deer Park. Uh, and actually, my dad was involved. And that's how I met John Vigiano. I met John Vigiano. He had joined the volunteer fire department <clears throat> at EMT back in the mid-'70s. And met my dad. Both of them were Marines, so they hit it off. My dad introduces me to John. I was a young teenager. And John Vigiano said, you want to come ride with me, kid? And I said, sure. At the time, he was a lieutenant in Rescue Company 2 in Brooklyn, which is a busy rescue company. And so I would go with him when I was maybe 16 years old and a couple of times. My neighbor directly across the street from me was a firefighter in Brooklyn. My neighbor next door was a retired firefighter from Brooklyn. So then I joined the volunteer fire department and uh, I said, this is pretty cool. I think I want to do this for a living. And so I took the test right out of high school and I got on the job the month after my 21st birthday. So I've been blessed. 
Absolutely. Uh, Chief of Department Thomas Richardson of the FTNY is our guest today on the Mike DeNuyaven podcast. Uh, we're certainly happy to have him for volume 10 of the best of the bravest interviews with the FTNY's elite. So the guys that trained you were guys that had just gone through the war years of the 60s and 70s when arson raged throughout the city. Now, the training, no matter the era, is always good. Um, at the FDNY and NYPD academies. These are very smart and gifted people who are breeding the best of the best for New York City. Um, but for this era, given what these men had been through, um, do you feel you had an especial, uh, you, you especially had a leg up getting into the fire service given the high volume they had been through and how much they could teach you as a result of that? Yeah, absolutely. When I came in the job, I got assigned to engine 227 in Brownsville section of Brooklyn. And like you said, I worked with firefighters that had been there uh, through those war years. And that was a very busy area of the city during that period of time. And not only were they uh, veteran firefighters, most of them were uh, veterans in the military. Most of them, uh, many of them served in Vietnam. Um, my, uh, my first captain, I think, was a Korean War veteran. And so... You know, between being military veterans and teaching me from their experience during the war years, actually, you know, I went there as a 21-year-old kid, and they actually helped me grow into a man. You know, uh, and it was a, it was a wonderful experience. And then throughout my career as a firefighter, the first 10 years of my career, um, I worked with some tremendous individuals and you know, officers and firefighters that really prepared me to be an officer, you know, when I did eventually get promoted to lieutenant. You know, coming in from the volleys, I had this conversation with Hank Malay, who you crossed paths with Hank, formerly of Rescue One, as well as Tim Brown from formerly of Rescue Three, because Tim was a firefighter in Newington, Connecticut, right. and Hank was also a volley out on the island as well. And I asked them both, I'm like, when you got there, did they like the fact you had prior experience or did they feel, ah, oh, we have to retrain you now? Because that's the Connecticut way or the Long Island way. This is the New York City way. Was that your case when you got to the firehouse or no? You know, it's funny when you come in the job and in, 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 uh, when you go into the fire academy, I remember when I went into the fire academy, uh, people would say, do not let them know that you're a volley. <laughs> you know, but they could figure it out because you had the aptitude, you knew the nomenclature, you knew the tools and equipment. You know, I had been a volley for about three years when I got on the job. But uh, no, I think that uh, you, you had the basics, you know, the, like I said, the basic nomenclature. You understood uh, a little bit about it, but nothing to prepare me for New York City, to be quite honest with you. You know, and uh, what I was going to uh, be in for in my first several years, I worked in great companies. I got to go, you know, I came on in 1980. And I, I, I got on at the end of what they would term as the really busy years. But, you know, through the 80s, we still caught our share of fires. And uh, I was blessed. I, I mean, I, I, I learned from the very best of the best. Absolutely. And a shout out to some of our friends here in the live chat. And remember, as I always like to say, if you have a question for the guest that you'd like him to answer or me to answer, uh, fire away in the chat. So Adam Apple, <laughs> that is your real name. Appreciate you being here. Alicia B, always a big supporter. Show Margaret Hearn. And Mike Milner's here. Mike Milner says, Mike Milner. Oh, Bollies are a path to the <laughs> Bollies are a path to the big leagues. And he's right. He's absolutely right. I agree with Mike 110%. And check out that episode, like I said earlier. If you haven't, Mike was a great guy to talk to. So, you know, a couple of questions on Proby life. One, the Proby really has to earn his stripes in the firehouse. And the guys can be ruthless, not in a mean-spirited way, but they'll, they'll bust your chops. So uh, what can you recall from Proby life? And uh, what was the moment they said, you know what, all right, this kid's okay? So when I think back, honestly and truthfully, in my first firehouse, uh, there was always the ribbing and the, and the kidding around. Uh, they were pretty mild, the guys I worked with. Uh, you know, they, they didn't really, uh, you know, do anything crazy. You know, it was pretty it was pretty reasonable stuff. Like, you know, it was basically just get in the sink, do what you're supposed to do, make sure you're the first one up uh, from the meal to do the dishes, make sure you're the last one sitting down when the meal time comes. Make sure you're up there doing all the committee work, making the beds and cleaning the firehouse and making sure the apparatus was in, in shape. But not really a lot of uh, pranksters that I worked with in my first firehouse, you know. Uh, so I didn't really have that experience, to be honest with you. I mean, a lot of kidding around, a lot of joking, you know, 21-year-old kid from Long Island, what the hell does he know, you know. 
And then, of course, when they find out you were a volley, then then they kind of they pile on a little bit. But uh, you know, it was uh, it was it, I had a pretty easy time of it to be honest with you. It wasn't really that bad. Yeah, you know, but the the thing is, if they if they don't bust your chops, that's the concern. Then you oh, should absolutely. really be it. Yeah, yeah but yeah, if, they, yeah, if they bust your chops, that means they like it. That's yeah, and that's a good right. thing. It builds camaraderie. And the other a couple of questions I wanted to ask. You know, there's always the saying amongst probies the black cloud and the white cloud for those that aren't familiar with the fire service either because you don't work in it or you're not a, a, a buff aka a nerd like yours truly <laughs> as i am for it uh black cloud means well there's a lot of runs for a lot of fires when you're in the firehouse white cloud not so much which cloud were you i was more of a white cloud to be honest with you you know i used to I remember being on the house watch uh with several of the younger guys that i worked with in engine 227 and we would be you know, listening to the department radio and there'd be fires going on all around us. And I'm like, God, when are we going to get something, you know, and we'd be waiting and waiting. And uh, I think I was more of a white cloud. I had my share, but, uh, you know, I, I would not call myself a black cloud, especially in the early part of my career. Do you remember your first run at all? My first fire was actually my second night tour. You know, I worked, I started my, I started with the two night tours. So my first night, my first run was uh, going to a fire. It was uh, we were the uh, the third do engine filling out a 1075. So the 1075 is a working fire. That was my first run on my first tour. Turned out to not be a big deal. My first fire was my second night tour, and it was like two blocks from the firehouse. And uh, I had the backup position on the on the hose line. And I remember getting into the building. And the captain said to this guy, Jerry Dalton, who had the nozzle, and Jerry was a senior guy. I guess Jerry had about 10, 11 years on the job, another, you know, experienced guy. And I remember the captain saying to Jerry when we got into the building on the first floor, the fire was in the back. It was a vacant building, and uh, the fire was in the back of the first floor, which used to be like a commercial occupancy, like a store or something like that. And uh, I remember the captain saying to Jerry, Jerry, Give the kid the nozzle. He says, it's only a couple of rooms, you know. So Jerry handed me the nozzle, and he backed me up. And we went in. You know, I thought it did a pretty good job, you know. And uh, I'm thinking I did a great job. And, then, you know, when we came out of the building, the whole building was on fire. It was a like three-story building or a four-story building. I don't remember. But it went to like a third along, you know. It was, it's like we did a good job on the first floor, but we didn't uh, the rest of the building was on fire. <laughs> But uh, I remember coming out of the building and going back to the firehouse, and I was like, I think I got burned. And I, I felt like something on my neck. So I take my shirt off, and I'm like, I had a nice, like a quarter size blister on my right, right in the middle of my chest. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I can't tell anybody. I can't go sick. It's my first fire, you know? So I just covered it up, you know, and all this and that. Next thing, and uh, I went home, and the next morning, my dad says, uh, How was your first? How was your night to us? He says, I had my first fire, you know, blah, 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 third alarm, you know. And he says, what happened? Because he, he could see, like, the bandage I put on, you know, through my T-shirt. And I said, nah, I got a little burn, no big deal. Let me see that. You know, he, was, he looks at me, Jesus Christ, you know, what, what the hell happened? So he calls my neighbor across the street who was on the job. And he comes over. He says, you got to go sick with that. I said, I'm not going sick. I says, I, I never went sick. I just covered it up, bandaged it up. I went back to work. And it's it, it's funny because we share some mutual friends and also in Kevin Kubler and Lou Refrano, the mm -hmm. Getting Salty experience. And Lou mentioned this not to me, but on Getting Salty one time when they were in SOC, when SOC came around in 98, unless it was like a really severe injury, like a broken leg or whatever it was, they would just tape it up and keep keep going. You know, they, they wouldn't stop. They just did. Unless it was severe, they would not go. And you have to respect that. Obviously, listen, if it's if it's bad health, it's bad health. You don't want to get you don't want to let it uh, fester to where it gets to a severe uh, degree. But if it's not something that is prohibiting you from doing your job to a, a major capacity, I, I admire the toughness for sure. Yeah. You know, we never want people to work if they're hurt or they're sick, you know, never, you know, and, and we don't advocate that at all. Right. Uh, you know, I would argue that, you know, 40 years ago was a little bit of a different time. Yeah. Uh, today, we, we, we tell people, listen, if you're injured, you need to see the doctor. You, you, you go on medical leave. We don't want people working hurt at all. Yeah. You know, uh, I tell you that story because it was, it, was just, it was just funny. My first fire, I got burned. I'm like, Jesus, how did that happen? You know, yeah. but it was uh, quite the experience. But I'll, I'll never forget it. And I guess nobody ever forgets their first fire. You know, it was, yeah. 
it was it's cool. an adrenaline rush. And, yeah, and there's yeah, some, yeah, I, I always reference this documentary because I think it's one of the pivotal documentaries made about firefighting in New York City. You've probably seen it. That's Still Riding, which came out in 2002. And Bobby Galeon from Rescue 2 in that documentary makes a, a mention of it to where 10 minutes ago, your back could have been hurting you. Your leg could have been, uh, you know, hurting you. Your hand might be barking at you for some injury you suffered. But then you're going up those stairs. Then you're laying the nozzle down. Then you're going up on the roof if you're in a ladder company. And all that, whatever was bothering you 10 minutes before, it's gone. Because right. that adrenaline's pumping at such a high rate. Right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And you're it's, in uh, This is a largely a, a, it's just like professional sports. Um, it's it's largely a mental a mental game uh, firefighting. You know you got to have your head in the game all the time, and you got to be prepared. And like you said, uh, sometimes you overlook or you don't even realize some of the things that have happened to you and your body because you're so pumped up and uh, excited about doing the work that you love to do. Absolutely. So I mean, working in Brooklyn, I mentioned it's the borough of fire. And I think some of the best police officers and some of the best firefighters in the history of New York City have been bred there. And, and crime in the 70s and 80s in Brooklyn, it's easy to see why there was just a lot going on. So cops were busy. But what is it about the borough of Brooklyn in the makeup of the buildings there that leads to it being a borough with, I think, as of recently, and correct me if I'm wrong, the most fire out of any of the boroughs that we have in New York City? Well, Brooklyn's a big borough. Like if you... You know, when you come over the Brooklyn Bridge into the borough of Brooklyn, there's a sign that says, Welcome to Brooklyn, the fourth largest city in America. It's a huge borough. So just by virtue of the fact that it's very, very big uh, is probably why overall, you know, uh, there's, there's uh, you know, cumulatively, there's more fires in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a very, very large, densely populated borough. Um, I worked in Manhattan for a little while up in the Harlem area and... Uh, Went to plenty of fires when I was up there as a young lieutenant. And then I uh, worked out in Queens, like, like as you know, in the squad 270 for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, South Queens, you know, they catch plenty of work too. But um, Brooklyn always had the reputation of uh, being, uh, you know, just uh, the, the, the spear decor is just like really gung-ho. And, and that's that's true throughout the job. But Brooklyn always had this, 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 uh, this extra special... Uh, um reputation of you know um units were close together so units where there was a lot of competition and uh trying to get in and and, and, and get to as many fires as you could possibly get to so um you know i i think some of that has has uh, dwindled over the years uh you know be, be, mostly for safety reasons right we want people yeah. to respond accordingly and uh we want people to do their job and get into the box uh, in sequence and do it the right way, you know, and, and be professionals. That's, that's what we're supposed to be. We're the, uh, we're the professionals. When people call us, we're supposed to be coming in there and, uh, doing our job. You know, when I hear, you know, you listen, you might listen to the radio or you listen to the radio at all, the fire yes. radio. I'm sure you yes. do. Right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when you hear people screaming on the radio sometimes, right. Uh, I remember when I was a chief officer, you know, you get a Lieutenant or an officer that give a, a very excitable, uh, 1075 on the radio, you know, and I often say, you know, listen, we're, we're supposed to be the professionals. So, uh, you know, when you do that, like, you got to act like you've done this before, like, because we're, we're the ones that people are counting on. Right. So, uh, but going back to the original question about Brooklyn, um, I was fortunate. I worked there most of my career, you know, I, I did. And, uh, we have great firefighters throughout the city of New York, man, everywhere you go, there's great firefighters. You know, you go to metal day every year. Uh, there's people that, do unbelievable uh, jobs all over the city uh, each and every year. So, uh, you know, it's spread out. But Brooklyn, because it's so big, you know, is probably why, you know, overall, you know, on paper, there's, there might be a few more fires there. Absolutely. So, you know, that transitions into your years in rescue, too. And I'll get to you actually joining the unit in a moment. But it's interesting, you know, you talk about how dense Brooklyn is. I have a mini series in this show profiling the NYPD's emergency service unit. And as you know, in Brooklyn, they have three trucks for that entire borough, truck six, right. truck seven, truck eight, because right. that's how big the borough is. Yeah. Rescue two, I mean, there's other companies that can help, obviously, yeah. if rescue one needs to come in, rescue three, but it's just rescue two for that borough. 
Right. And here you are going into that unit where the captain has to interview you. There's a lot of legends there. You know the names. Mike Penna was there at the time. Lee Ielpi was there at the time. John Vigiano was there at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're on a roster full of all-stars. How daunting was that for you? If it honest? was it, When I first went there, I had six years on the job. And I, I did four and a half years in engine 227. I was two and a half years in ladder 102 working with a, a captain there and the officers there that were just in, unbelievable officers. Uh, Dennis Cross was the captain, was killed on 9-11. This guy, John Dargerty, uh, Frank Deletto, um, uh, Joe Dirks, Tommy DeAngelis, who was also killed on 9-11. Uh, those are the people I worked with uh, in, 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 the, in, in 102. And then I go to rescue, Ray Downey's the captain, Vigiano's the lieutenant. Uh, then John Norman came as a lieutenant. Paul McFadden came as a lieutenant. We had Craig Shelley, Artie Connolly, a legend, Artie Connolly. Uh, I felt very, very small. You know, I felt I, I don't know anything, you know. But, uh, again, uh, these guys taught me how to be a firefighter, how to be a better firefighter. And uh, I had a good base. I had a, a good base from where I worked and who I worked with. But when I went there, I felt like, wow, I got a lot to learn. And the three years I spent there before I got promoted to lieutenant, uh, I'm convinced, you know, prepared me well to be an officer in the fire department. You know, I, uh, I was, uh, of course, you know, you're anxious, you're nervous when you're going to get promoted. But the time I spent there and the people I worked with, you named some of them, aside from the officers, Ielpi, Bondi, Evers, there's, there were so many. Uh, Bill Hewitson, God, uh, the Howard brothers. Uh, oh, my God. It was, it was, it was the... Uh, it was it was one of the highlights of my career, you know, and it really did prepare me for the future, you know. And I continued to study, and and, and I was very very fortunate to to get promoted and uh, be where I am today. But I look back on those years, and uh, you know, no matter what rank you get to in the fire department, you know, we're all firefighters. That's who we are. That's who we want to be. And uh, those those folks there that I worked with in rescue, and the people before that, uh, they made me into a firefighter. And uh, John Vigiano used to say. You give me somebody with heart and desire, I'll make him into a firefighter. And he was right. And he was right. He was 100% right. right. And he's still right to this day. And I think you guys tell me if I'm wrong. And he sadly also got killed on 9 11. Dennis Mohica was with you guys for a while before he went to Rescue One, right? Dennis was a firefighter in Rescue Two. When I went there, he was there. He became one of my closer friends there when I first went to the company. And uh, he, was, he was quite a firefighter and uh, just a gentleman. And then he uh, he had gotten promoted and went on and, and then became a lieutenant in Rescue One. Terry Hatton was the captain of Rescue One. I worked with him uh, in Rescue Two for a short while before he got promoted. Um, and Terry was in my probie class too, so we had a, we had a pretty special bond as well. Absolutely, and it's funny. Paul Hassigan said in the documentary, still writing as well about Dennis. There was a clip where they were in May of two thousand one. They're responding to two scaffolders that are stuck on a high rise, and they get him to safety with no issues. Um, Paul joked about Dennis. He's like, he was never really a yeller. He just sweat a lot. <laughs> yeah, he did sweat a lot. He did sweat a lot. He did yeah. sweat a lot. Uh, yeah, that, he was, uh, what a guy. Uh, man, I had so much fun with him. And he was just such a great guy. Just a great person. Oh, absolutely. It, it's, it sure seemed like it. So you mentioned Ray Downey. Everybody remembers Ray Downey as a chief, you know, with Special Operations Command towards the end of his career and the end of his life. Of course, he lost his life too on that, on that awful day. But being in Rescue 2, working under him, you know what his nickname was, behind his back, never to his face, you guys called him God. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, working with him, not just as a firefighter, but as a person, what was it like being around him? So Ray Downey was a, uh, a man of principle. Ray Downey uh, had very high standards. He demanded that you do your job. And it was intimidating, to be quite honest, when I first went there. Now, I knew him a little bit. Again, he's a Deer Park guy. You know, he, uh, he he lived not too far from where I lived, you know, and I didn't really know him well, you know, I just knew of him and then I got to know him a little bit over the years. But uh, when I went to the company, he had a very, very, very high standards, man. And uh, you better do your job and do it well. And when you screw up, you just got to admit you screwed up. But I would say he was a guy when you would go to a fire and things were, were just craziness, you know, and the chief would say to Ray Downey, Hey Ray, see what you you know, see what we could do in here, you know, see we get something done here, and uh, kind of he would get into a building, and I never saw anybody else do this. Like he he just had a knack where he could walk in and it's total chaos, 
and he'd start barking out a few orders. And next thing you know, the fire went out. Everything went, we took care of business and uh, came out. Chief said, thanks a lot, Ray. Thanks for rescue. You guys can take up. And uh, he had that presence. He had a, a really strong command presence at all times, not only in the firehouse, uh, he was pretty quiet in the firehouse, you know, he didn't spend a lot of time in the kitchen, you know, but when he did, you know, he was, uh, he was stern, but he was, uh, he was an excellent fire officer. One of the toughest fire officers I ever worked with. He was a tough guy, man. He was a really, really tough guy on the fire floor. Very, very tough. And he, 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 uh, he was so good too, though. I remember when, before I got promoted, how he took the time to bring me up in the office to kind of start to show me you know, like the officer's responsibilities. And so I would be a little better prepared when I, when I did get promoted, uh, how to do some of the office stuff, how to do the roll calls, how to do this and how to do that. And, uh, he was a, a great mentor. He was like a, like a father figure, you know, uh, but he was a tough guy, you know, no doubt about it. And uh, when you screwed up, you know, I, 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 if I could tell you, just this is, one of my favorite, this is one of my favorite stories. So you may have heard of Mike Esposito. Yes. Mike Esposito was killed in 9-11. Mike was one of the funnier guys we worked with in rescue. And him and I went there kind of around the same time. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we go to a fire and uh, any, it was actually for anybody. You know, if you had the roof, Ray Downey wanted you to take the saw all the time. No matter what, if I could be in the cellar, you better have the saw. So many times, you know, some of us were lazy. And Mike one time went to a job and he didn't take the saw. And so when we get back to the rig, Downey says to him, where's the saw? And he says, it's in the rig. It's in the first two trucks rig. Because a lot of times we would take it. And if we weren't going to use it, we would throw it in the first two ladder company's apparatus right in front of the building. And then we would go about our business and then get it when we were leaving. And he says, well, go get it. And then the jig was up, you know, he didn't have the, the saw wasn't in the rig, man. Mike never brought the saw, you know, and so the captain started yelling at him. It was pretty funny. But Mike Esposito was one of the few guys that could make great down. He left. He, there you he, go. Uh, he was a character, man. Uh, a lot of great characters through the years and the praise the fire department. Um, you know, I want to focus on one particular rescue in Rescue 2 that you were part of in a moment. But first, technical rescue. If you're going to be in the special operations of the NYPD, like ESU, if you're going to be in the special operations command of the FDNY, Technical rescue is something you have to know every aspect of. There is no shortcutting it. Either you know it or you better learn it uh, because you're not going to be in special operations very long if you don't. So for you in the training, um, what what particular aspects of technical rescue did you most enjoy training in? You know, back in those days when I was in the company, we didn't really have the formal training that they do today. Most of the training was on the job training. Uh, we certainly didn't have the amount of equipment the technical rescue that they do today and most of it was on the job uh and you know Artie Connolly Lieutenant Connolly he was a, a big proponent of making sure we understood how to use ropes properly but he was a very simple guy and because we didn't have all the equipment even the training that we did back then it was very simple stuff it was never really highly technical the guys in rescue too uh, if you talk to anybody that's been in that company over the years uh, they live by that whole keep it simple, stupid, uh, uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, it's you, like today they have a lot of formal training, a tremendous amount of training, hundreds of hours of training. We didn't have that back then and we didn't have the equipment. But um, I would say that, you know, the uh, the biggest part of special training that I would say was uh, was intimidating to me or that I remember the best was the scuba training. You know, you had to come into the company as a scuba diver, like a basic scuba diver, and then you would get the uh, the additional training while you were in the company. And uh, that was one of the things. I wasn't a great diver. Uh, I didn't like it, you know, uh, diving in black water around New York City. But the training that we got was good. You know, it was uh, we did get some outside training when I was there, but not to the level they get today. The, the, the people are really well prepared today, much better prepared than I think I was uh, back in those days, but I remember the scuba training was, uh, it was pretty cool. It was very, uh, intimidating. It was a little more technical and, uh, they, they, they did their very best to prepare you to be a, a decent rescue diver. Uh, but I wasn't that good at it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I go back to my conversation with our friend Ray Seely from 270 and 288, Ray, Ray for a brief period of time from 05 to 06, I think was the Lieutenant in charge of the scuba unit 
of the mm-hmm. FDNY. And I just asked him, like, how did you do it? You know, because he lo- he loved it. That was like one of his favorite things. I'm like, how does one, I'm scared just to go into the pool and I'm tall enough to where I can just walk in the pool. I'm fine. I can't imagine diving into the Hudson River or any river for that matter. And who knows what's even in that river. That's It's black water for a reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, where you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Sometimes I, it just amazes me some of the incredible rescues that are made because you're not, and tell me if I'm wrong with this, you would know better than I would. You're not going by sight, that's for sure. You're going by feel mostly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the people that are really good at it uh, um, are, are the folks that are most comfortable in the water, right? If you're really comfortable in the water, you're going to be better at it, right? And uh, they have so much more uh, advanced equipment today. The communications between the diver and the people up top is better than it was. We had it back then, but it's so much better now. Uh, New York City firefighters uh, that dive, they duck tethered. Everybody's tethered. So, you know, there's a bit of confidence in that, right? Uh, and I don't know the half of it anymore because I haven't been there in such a long time, but I know it's very technical. And anybody that runs the scuba unit, uh, they usually want people there that, that, are, that are into it, you know, that, that like it, that, that were good at it. And uh, I'm sure when Ray did it, he did a great job. And uh, any, I know some of the people that work there even now, they, they're just uh, very, very dedicated to that, to that craft. You know, and making sure that our people have the best equipment and are better trained or best trained that they possibly can be. January 10th, 1989, a day much like this one, very cold, very blistery. Uh, there was a roof rope rescue you were involved in in Brooklyn. Now, when you think of roof rep, roof rope rescues in FDNY history, the one that everybody thinks of, you probably know what I'm going to mention is the one with Patty Brown and Kevin Shea in Manhattan, right. which was a great, great rescue that they did. Yeah. But this one's pretty interesting. It's kind of almost a last resort for the FDNY. It's a very, very technical aspect of rescue. And you, I believe, were on the rope to rescue a 15-year-old boy from a fire? It was a 15-year-old, yes. Take me through that. Yeah, so uh, as, as, as anybody would tell you that, that's been involved in a rope rescue, uh, I would say most of them don't go 100% according to plan. You know, we drill a lot. We train a lot for it. Uh, you have to know it. You got to know it cold when you have to do it. And that particular night, you know, we were coming back from a, uh, another job. Um, and we were pretty close to this when this box came in. I guess it was like, I remember it was like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, something like that. And uh, if I remember correctly. And we were coming back from a job. Ray Downey was working. He was the officer. And we got in pretty quickly. Uh, we got in before the second through ladder company. And uh, it was a fire in a three-story brownstone type building. You know, it has a high stoop. And pretty good amount of fire on the second floor, which we call the parlor floor. Uh, and I had the roof. So I went up the area ladder to the roof and got up to the roof, you know, heavy smoke condition. The first dude truck company roof firefighter was up there doing his job. And uh, I heard some screaming going on towards the back of the building. And I look over and, uh, you know, sure enough, there's a woman hanging out the window on the top floor, the third floor. Bob Gallion was working in ladder 176. He was in the backyard. He was the outside vent firefighter. And he was, you know, talking to the people, you know, telling them not to jump. And uh, so I'm like, oh, my God, like, I guess I got to do this, you know. So I went through the motions, set, set, setting it up. And the firefighter that was on the roof uh, from the first two truck, you know, we, we went through the motions to get it all set up. And uh, when I say things don't go 100% according to plan, this one didn't go according to plan. I was very lucky that I didn't get hurt uh, or, or even killed, to be honest with you. So um, when I went over the edge of the roof, I could hardly see the guy that was uh, lowering me. And, you know, we were communicating verbally. And at one point I, I was saying, is, is, are we good to go? We're good to go. And, you know, this woman's like screaming. Galeon screaming to the woman in the back. And uh, so he, 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 I heard him say, go. So I went. So when I go off the edge of the roof, I dropped like about two feet. I'm like, that wasn't good. Like, right. So now I'm calling them on the radio and they're, they're lowering me down uh, and they lower me too far. So now my, like my head is at the windowsill and this woman is screaming. And somehow, some way they pulled me up a little bit. And she's screaming about a baby. So I said, give me the baby. Give me the baby. And uh, who comes out the window is this 15-year-old kid. That was a baby. He was like six foot two. He was a big boy. 
and he kept climbing out. You know, we, uh, they lowered me down to the ground, and he was he was in pretty decent shape. He was a little, uh, you know, he took a little smoke. Uh, but then Ray Downey and the guys on the inside, they wound up getting two other people out, the woman, and there was another gentleman in the, in, in the apartment that had been burned pretty badly. They got him out from the inside. But after the fire was all over, uh, you go out to the front of the building and, uh, you know, Ray Downey taps me on the shoulder and says, did you, did you do a rope rescue? I says, yeah. He says, I, I couldn't get through on the radio to tell the chief because it was total chaos, you know, a lot going right. on. And, uh, he says, holy geez, you know, well, so he tells the chief, and then another guy comes tapping me on the shoulder, this guy, Tony Asaro, he was the chauffeur in 176, senior firefighter, uh, good guy, and he says, hey, did you know when you went over the roof, he says that uh, so-and-so didn't take the turns in the hook on the rope, he was, they lowered me hand over hand, like two guys, which was, it was crazy. So it, I was embarrassed because we kind of screwed it up. Everything worked out. You know, uh, I didn't get hurt. We got the kid down and, and everything worked out. But it was a, l- a little bit embarrassing because if you're the firefighter going over, you got to make sure that it's done right. And I guess in the excitement of it all, uh, whatever, I heard I heard, I heard, heard the, uh, the words go. I went. And as it turned out, this young man who was the firefighter on the roof, His name was Don Schneider. Uh, Don went on to become a captain, but Don went on to become one of my firefighters in Squad 270 when uh, when I became the captain. And we talked about that fire all the time. And uh, he, uh, I said, the only reason why I took you to the squad is I had to keep an eye on you. So you get. (laughs) But uh, he was great. He was a great firefighter. He turned out to be an excellent officer. He retired as the captain of Squad 252. So that was a lesson learned for me. And I took that lesson throughout the rest of my career when I got promoted. And I would tell people that story all the time. And I told it because you have to be sure that we've done our best to set this rope rescue operation up the way it's supposed to be. And again, none of them go 100% according to plan. Uh, The ones that have been done that I've talked to people, um, almost none of them. So it is a last resort. Uh, but when you do it, you got to get it right. And uh, that night I was very lucky. So, you know, I, I uh, made a mistake and I got away with it. You know, like we do a lot in this job. You know, you talk to people, you, I'm sure you talk to firefighters. Yep. You know, and uh, sometimes we get very lucky. A lot of close calls. Uh, it's kind of like that line from Bob Euchre in A Wild Thing. Yeah, Just right. a bit outside. Yeah. 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 So, you, you know, that, that brings us, let's talk about your promotion to captain. You know, you talked about earlier how your time in Rescue 2 prepared you for becoming a fire officer. And now, you know, the guys are looking to you. And I think leadership is key in anything. Mark Messier, the great New York Ranger, just put out a book about how no one wins alone. People look at him as one of the best leaders in sports history because he got the most out of his men. And there was nothing that he did that he wouldn't ask somebody else to do. And they knew he wasn't BSing because he would do it himself. So for you, as a captain, when you're in charge of these men who want to get after it, who want to do these, this great work and who are eager in all the right ways. Sometimes you have to know when to send them in. Sometimes you have to know when to pull them back right. and managing personalities, you know, uh, of different characters in the firehouses, you well know, uh, is, is a line that has to be walked delicately. So for you, um, what are some of the key lessons to being an effective fire officer and what helped you early on so that the guys looked at you and said, you know what? I trust my life to this guy. He's a good captain and I'm glad he's my captain. Right. So when you, I always tell people there's a difference between a captain and a company commander. I say that I say that in almost every promotion ceremony when we're promoting people Mm -hmm. to the various ranks. Well, in particular, captain in the New York City Fire Department, as you know, every company has a captain and three lieutenants, but there's only one captain. Uh, Every battalion has four battalion chiefs. One of them is the battalion commander. Every division has four deputy chiefs. Um, but there's only one captain. It's your company. It's your ship, right? And uh, I, I often tell people that you have to be able to set the tone, set the standards, hold everybody accountable to those standards, and uh, it's your ship and it's your responsibility to do the best you possibly can for all of your people. But it's also about building up a mutual trust. You know, in the fire service, trust is everything. We're a team, and we have to have trust in one another. So as a company commander, the lieutenants, 
that are working for you and the firefighters, they have to trust you, right? And then you have to have a mutual trust with all of them, right? And um, I always felt like my job as a company commander was to develop those that are working for me. I wanted my firefighters to all be studying and become fire officers someday, uh, all talented people. I wanted my lieutenants to study and become captains uh, and, and, and maybe take my job someday, right? So I think that uh, some of the guiding principles for me were always about trust, teamwork, um, making sure that everybody understood the mission. You know, we, we're mission focused. It's all about the mission in the fire department. You know, we have a, a very clear mission, save lives, save property, right? Um, and then make sure that they're trained to the highest level so that they can be the best firefighters that they can be. But it really is all about trust because leadership is about influence. It's about being able to influence people, right? So as a company commander, I feel our best company commanders are people that have a tremendous amount of trust for their people and that people, uh, and, 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 and they, they have a tremendous amount of trust because on the fire ground, you, you're not supervising each and every person individually at the same time. You can't. It's, it's impossible. Especially in a squad company or in a ladder company where firefighters are remote from you. You know, you're talking to them on the radio. You have this functional supervision. So you don't know exactly what they're doing all the time. But if you train them right and you prepare them, they're going to do a good job. And when, when, when things don't go so well, right, we got to hold them accountable. So accountability is big. You know, uh, if you're going to be an effective company commander, I think that's huge. Uh, that was my favorite rank in the fire department, being a captain. It really was. I was a battalion chief. I spent the most time as a battalion chief. I was a battalion chief for 14 years uh, before I got promoted to deputy chief. But I And I loved being a battalion chief. I was in a great battalion, but I loved being a captain. It was my favorite rank. I was the captain of an engine company before I went to the squad. And I, I, uh, I loved that company as well. And... I always felt it was about developing people and you develop people through trust. You develop people by setting the bar high, uh, setting the tone and making sure that you hold them accountable to it. Next July, July 1st, 2023, Special Operations Command will turn 25 years old. Right. Um, it's hard to believe it's been around that long, nearly a quarter century in service to the city of New York and its great people, 8 million residents. Um, you know, what's great about it is so many guys that were in rescue companies. You know, I, I mentioned our friend Hank. Hank was in Rescue One. This opportunity came up and he went there. We got the seniority in SOC because it was a great mix. People like you that had a lot of time on the job and young guys that had just gotten on really wanted to be there and really wanted to learn. So did they come to you about going to SOC or did you just put in an application? How did that work? So back when I went to rescue, uh, it was it was mostly you went you, you you went and saw the captain somebody put a good word in for you uh now this, the the, uh, the the program is much more um much more formalized so you have to fill out an application you have to f uh, submit your application you do uh you know speak to the company commander of the unit that you would like to go to but then you get on a list and then there's interviews you interview with the company commander with a chief from the Special Operations Command. And then each company commander develops a list of candidates. And then over time, as openings occur, that company commander selects from their list. And all of these folks have been vetted uh, through this process. So it's a, it's a written policy. So it's very much more formalized than when I went to SOC as a, as a, a firefighter. And when I went to SOC as a captain, when I went to 270, that was the time when they formed five new squad companies in 1998. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, basically, uh, you know, I was in engine 234. I had been the captain there for about three years. And uh, Ray Downey called me and asked me if I was interested. And I, at, the, at the time, I wasn't sure. But shortly, he kind of talked me into it. And uh, I took the opportunity. I was on the battalion chief's list. And I said to him, I'm on the chief's list. I said, I don't know how long I'm going to be there. He said, well, if, you, if we could get this thing going, give me a couple of years, uh, I'll be happy with that. So it wound up being one of the best opportunities in my career. I was there for two and a half years in the squad, got it off the ground, brought in some great people. And, uh, but now the, 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 uh, the, 
the way to get into SOC is is very formal now. You know, you have to go through this whole process of application and interviews, and uh, it's a pretty big deal. So uh, um, it works. It actually works out pretty well. I think it does. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. But it, and it's funny because there was such great. I go back to the leadership aspect of it. We had great leadership in uh, in the squads at that time. You look at two eighty eight as an example. Dennis Murphy was the captain originally a squad 288 that guy's the real deal ed metcalf who should really come on this show by the way yeah. uh, was the captain of uh squad 252 out in brooklyn uh and a great leader in his own right so you know there, there was a good base like i said a good nucleus i go back to the sports analogy the yankees teams the late 90s uh the dynastic teams that won four world series in five years they had grizzled veterans there like wade boggs and chuck malblock and bernie williams paul o'neill but they also had the young guys they had Derek jeter they had andy pettit and that mix is what made those teams work, and that's what made set special operations then and now uh, continue to work as, as one of the great uh, rescue operations, uh, not just in New York, but anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world for that matter. So as you mentioned, you were promoted to battalion chief in 2000. You spent 14 years in that rank, and that was the rank you held on the morning of September 11th, 2001. Um, take me through that day from your perspective. So I was off that day. So when I got promoted to battalion chief, I got assigned to headquarters for about 10 months. And I worked for the chief of operations, who at the time was Dan Nigro, who's now the fire commissioner. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and a group of other chiefs that had been newly promoted, they assigned us to headquarters. And we worked as his assistants. You know, we did projects for him. And then I was here from September of 2000. In July of 01, he said, we're going to put you guys out in the field, where would you like to go? And, you know, he went around, he went around the table and I, I said, I'd like to go to Manhattan as a battalion chief. I think that'd be a good opportunity for me, you know? And he says, uh, I got some other, I, I have something else for you. I think uh, I'd like you to consider. And I'm like, what could that be? So he said, come back at the lunch. So I go back at the lunch and he asked me to go out to Queens and take a spot in a battalion out in Eastern Queens for a year. Uh, he says, I need a young, you know, energetic battalion chief with some experience to go out. So um, I can't tell the chief of operations. No. So I'm like, oh, I'll go. So I was there in July of 01. And the day on 9-11, I was off that day. I was home. I was out jogging. I uh, came home from a jog. And I put the TV on and I saw that the towers were hit. And then shortly thereafter, we all got recalled in. So I had to report to my firehouse in Queens. And uh, when I got to the firehouse, uh, you know, the companies were out. They had relocators uh, from different parts of the city. Uh, the battalion was already out. And uh, so I was there. And then we all got, a bunch of us got sent to the old Shea Stadium. They started, they made a, uh, um, a staging area at, at Shea Stadium. And we were forming teams, companies. And then buses were going to take people over to the Trade Center. Uh, so hundreds of firefighters came to Shea Stadium, me and a bunch of other chiefs, we were forming them into teams, an officer and four or five firefighters, and uh, MTA buses were going to come and transport. But we wound up getting held there for quite a while, most of the day, because at one point they were overwhelmed with people, because a lot of people went straight there from home. Um, and so I was at Shea Stadium until about 8 o'clock at night, and they released everybody, said, just go back to your firehouse. I went back to the firehouse and there was no chief car there. The chief was still relocated to Manhattan. And the next morning, I got a fax in the machine in the 5-3 battalion out in Queens that I had been detailed to Special Operations Command uh, due to the fact that three of the battalion chiefs in the, in the Special Operations Battalion at the time had been killed. Ray Downey was missing. Uh, and so I got detailed to SOC. And so I reported to SOC the next morning, and then I went down to the World Trade Center site on September 12th. And then I wound up being in the Special Operations Command uh, for about 15 months. You know, through the rescue and recovery, I stayed in the battalion up until the end of 2002. And uh, John Norman had taken over as the Chief of Special Operations. And uh, he asked me to stay, but I said, John, you know, I've always wanted to go out and be a battalion chief in a regular battalion and go to fires and be the incident commander. And I've enjoyed my 15 months here. It's been a kind of a stressful time, you know, trying to rebuild the command. 
uh, but I'm, I'm ready to go out and, and be a chief. So I wound up going back to Brooklyn. Uh, I, for, I, 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 I decided not to do Manhattan. I said, I'm just going to go back to Brooklyn. And then I wound up becoming a chief in the 3A Battalion in Crown Heights. And then I spent the next, from so I went there in January, February of 03, and I got promoted in uh, 2014 to, to deputy chief. Uh, for my listeners who aren't familiar with New York, he referenced Shea Stadium. Shea Stadium, if you don't know, that's where the New York Mets used to play for many, many years from 1964 until 2008. The Jets used to play there as well. And when Yankee Stadium was being renovated in the mid-70s, the Yankees temporarily played there um, as well. Great ballpark. Great ballpark. Yes, it was. That, it that was. Uh, Mike Piazza used to hammer balls out of uh, with great frequency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's it for those of you that don't know New York. That's what he was talking about. So I'll ask you before we pivot to a different subject, given the fact that you were off that day, given the fact that Sock was decimated, so much of the high ranking brass of the FDNY, like Jerry Barber, Donald Burns, Pete Gancy, all were killed that day. Bill Fian, do you feel that getting into the firehouse at the time that you did not being detailed down there until the following day, do you feel that's the reason you're still here today? Well, you know, by the time I got to work, both towers had, had collapsed. So by the time I got into Queens, into the firehouse, but I will say this, when Dan Nigro asked me to go to Queens in July, I wanted to go to Manhattan. So, you know, I don't know, like who knows if I would have went to Manhattan, could I have been working that day? I, I could have, right? Uh, there was a chief that was with us that got promoted with us that did go to Manhattan and he wound up getting killed, Matty Ryan. And, uh, so who knows? Uh, Dan Nigro maybe saved my life by not letting me go to Manhattan. Who knows, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. But uh, you're right. Uh, Sock got pretty pretty banged up, lost over 90 people, and uh, many of which were my friends, among others. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, the people that took the leadership of the department after 9-11, and I can't say enough about them, the chiefs that stepped up, came to staff. Uh, Nigro became the chief of department. Uh, later on, many years later, he becomes the commissioner. But all of the staff chiefs that came in after 9-11 and rebuilt this department over the next four, five, six, ten years, uh, tremendous leaders, tremendous individuals. Uh, I can't say enough about them. They, they, they rebuilt this department. They really did a great job. Absolutely. I'll hit on a few more things because you're busy. You know, you got a lot of things going on. And I don't want to keep you too long and you've been oh, so good. generous to be here. Um, so, you know, the FDNY's fight to protect New York City changed so much after that day to where, you know, I, I think I said this to, I believe it might have been Dennis Tardio, who was featured in the Gideon, in the Gideon and Jules Mel Day documentary, was in the North Tower. Him and all his men thankfully survived that day. Um, you know, who, if you would have thought, and I'll say to you the same thing. In 1980, the FDNY would have a world-class counterterrorism bureau today. I mean, who would have th thought that? Joseph Pfeiffer, the great chief, ran it for so many years. I mean, a lot of people think of the PD counterterrorism operation, understandably, but the FD is not ill-prepared. Um, and you went to a lot of schooling after that. I mentioned when I was introducing you, the Naval Postgraduate mm -hmm. School. Terrorism is not a foreign thing to New York City. You were on the job for the 1993 bombing of the Trade Center. I'm sure you remember the various domestic terrorist bombings in the 70s and 80s by different radical groups. But now, having been to that school, having seen what the operations are like day to day for the FDNY's Counterterrorism Bureau, how much of an eye opener has that been for you? All of those programs that you mentioned earlier, they were all a result of 9-11. You know, as you know, as most of the folks listening probably know, but maybe not, you know, after 9-11, the department said, we need to look at our response to 9-11, right? We learned a lot. We were overwhelmed. We thought we were the New York City Fire Department. We can handle anything. Well, we were really overwhelmed uh, from a command level perspective. And we brought in um, outside incident management teams from other parts of the country to help us organize. Um, we have such a robust response capability today, not only uh, do we have the Center for Terrorism and Disaster Preparedness, uh, we have an unbelievable USAR team, our FEMA Task Force One. Uh, we've had, we had that before 9-11, but now it's become even 
to a higher level. We have our own SOC task force to be utilized in, the, in our local area and in the region and in the state. Uh, we have an incident management team that was developed uh, after 9-11 that responded to Hurricane Katrina. And that was like their uh, hallmark. That was their first outside deployment. And now our incident management team is recognized throughout the country. So we have that resource for our own use here in New York as well. All of the special operations training now that was built on, built upon after 9-11, uh, we are the best trained, best equipped fire department anywhere, man. It's it's uh, it's impressive. It's impressive to me. And I sit here as the chief of the department, and we 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 can respond to just about anything. All of the hazmat capabilities that we have today uh, for response and mitigation of hazardous materials incidents, weapons of mass destruction. That was why the five squads were formed in 1998. Ray Downey was like a visionary. He said, we got to be prepared for terrorism. This is 1998, right? Mm -hmm. um, I forget which bomb. There had been a bombing somewhere overseas. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Kobar Towers. Yeah, that was what it was, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, um, so terrorism was overseas for the most part, right? We weren't seeing that kind of stuff here in the United States. But Ray Downey said, you know what? Uh, we need to have a better hazmat capability, a better capability to respond to weapons of mass destruction. So that was 1998. Mm -hmm. So those squads were formed mostly to be hazmat support units, in which we were. Um, and then it just kind of built upon that over the next 20 years. And, you know, our, our response capabilities are unbelievable from hazmat to scuba to technical rescue, uh, let alone firefighting. Uh, we do medical work, as you know. So you know, our, our Bureau of EMS operations, EMTs and paramedics, the best in the business, uh, doing a tremendous amount of calls every day. So the New York City Fire Department is is uh, a very robust organization in, in all aspects and all hazards agency. Even the chief of department going back to June of last year, it is a rank that has been held by legendary figures. Dan Nigro has held that rank. Bill Fian held that rank. Pete Gancy held that rank. Edward Crocker held that rank and he produced one of the greatest quotes in firefighting history. I have what I have but one aspiration, and that is to be a fireman, end quote. So here you are now in that same rank, the highest ranking uniformed officer in a department that is like no other, as you just said. That moment for you when you were sworn in and you put that right hand up and you said that you would do this job, how emotional a moment was that for you given you started out in 1980, a long time ago, in a different time, in a different city, and here you are now in this role. Take me through your emotions in that moment. So, and, and, and I'm being 100% honest, you know, I was a battalion chief for 14 years, like I said. I had taken two deputy chiefs exams and I failed, both of them. You know, I didn't really study that hard. And uh, I guess my heart wasn't in it, you know. And when I took the deputy chief's exam in 2013, um, I got into a study group with some of my best friends, uh, Chief Frank Lieb. He's the chief of the fire academy now. Uh, chief Richie Blattis, he's the assistant chief of operations. Chief Joe Jordan, he's now the chief of fire prevention. All staff chiefs uh, and a few other fellows. And they talked me into studying. Frank Lieb in particular, he's a young, energetic guy. Come on, you got to study. And at the time, you know, I had 30, 33 years on the job. And I was like, Frank. I got 14 years in the ring. I'm done. I'm not studying. But he, he kind of motivated me to study. I had the time to do it because my kids were grown. And uh, I did well on the deputy chief's exam. Next thing I know, I get promoted, never expecting to be a staff chief. But in 2017, uh, Chief Jimmy Hodgins was the chief of training, called me up and asked me if I would be interested in being the chief of the fire academy. And then uh, Dan Nigro was the commissioner. He called me shortly thereafter and asked me if I would take the spot as the chief of the fire academy. And I did. And so that was my career. That was when my career started as a staff chief, 2017. So to go from deputy assistant chief, chief of the fire academy to the chief of department in like four years is just, it, it, it blew my mind. So the day I was getting sworn in, I was like, I can't, I can't even believe this is happening. Like, you know, it was crazy. Um, certainly an honor. Right. I mean, the honor of a lifetime, you know, uh, 
I was sitting there looking at my wife and my kids and my grandkids, and it was uh, it was emotional, but it was uh, a proud moment. You know, both of my parents were deceased by then, but uh, my dad would have been so proud, man. He was a Korean War combat Marine, tough guy. Uh, John Vigiano had was deceased, you know, in 2018, so he didn't get to see it. And he asked me one time, would you like to be chief of department someday? Uh, and I didn't really answer him if I remember correctly. I said, I don't know. I like being doing what I'm doing in training right now. But uh, I had his wife there that day when I got sworn in. I brought John's wife in, Jan, and uh, uh, she's a wonderful woman. So it was a it was a proud day. It was an emotional day. It was a it was a, there was a lot of things going through my mind. But uh, as I sit here today, I, uh, I I I almost can't believe it. You know, I really can't. Uh, but Pete Gancy who I got to work with when I was a lieutenant. He was a chief uh, in my firehouse as a battalion chief. He often said, and a lot of people quote him very, very often and say, you know, um, when people ask you what you what you did for a living, you say, I was a New York City firefighter, and it doesn't get any better than that. And I tell people today, and I try to remember, you know, you, you hear people say all the time about leaders, you know, remember where you came from, right? I try to do that every day I come to work. I'm a firefighter. That's what I tell people. I'm a firefighter. That's who I am. Uh, I just had a couple of lucky Saturdays. I uh, got promoted a few times, and uh, here I am. But uh, the people that work for us, the firefighters, fire officers, EMTs, paramedics that are out in the field right now as I speak, you know, I'm looking out my window. They're responding to calls every single day. Those are the folks we have to take care of. Those are the folks we have to make sure they have what they need. Uh, that's our job here in headquarters to support what they do each and every day. Uh, one more thing I want to ask you before we get to the concluding segment, and I've enjoyed this conversation a lot. The New York City Fire Department is in a fight of a different kind right now with coronavirus. Coronavirus is still raging on, and even though vaccination rates are increasing, we have Omicron that's wreaking havoc. Um, and it's a scary time, and members have been lost, both civilian and uniform members alike. Uh, take me through what the department's game plan is right now against the coronavirus. Right. So right now uh, we are seeing a spike in our medical leave due to COVID. Um, and so that's a strain on our staffing, both in fire and EMS operations. But we're answering every single call that's coming in. Uh, you know, our firefighter, everybody's stepping up to the plate, working a lot of overtime. Uh, people are getting beat up a little bit. Um, we're just trying to maintain our staffing levels as best we can. Um, the medical leave is just in the last couple of days starting to pick down a little bit, uh, but the Omicron, you know, uh, variant, I guess, I, I see the statistics every day, you know, it is raging throughout the city. Um, we're just trying to tell our people to make sure they're wearing their PPE properly, uh, protect yourselves as much as you can. Uh, my son's an EMT in the fire department. He works out in Queens. Uh, he just got COVID for the second time. You know, he got it last year, right in the beginning, uh, the first wave. And then he worked last weekend, you know, had a busy weekend riding around on the ambulance. And he woke up Monday and he and he was sick, you know, not very badly, thankfully, but uh, he got sick again. So it is raging. Uh, we're doing our best to manage it. Uh, you know, our EMS operations folks are getting beat up pretty good. You know, uh, the ambulances are out there uh, very, very, very busy, you know, and we're uh, we're just working to try and keep our people as safe as we possibly can. We have to respond. We're not going to stop responding. We'll respond to every call that people give us and uh, do it the best we can. But uh, strategically, um, you know, we, we're, we're always thinking of what we can do to um, manage call volume, particularly on the EMS side of the house. And uh, there's a lot of different strategies going on. They're using telemedicine a little bit as much as they can tell them, you know, give them turning patients over to telemedicine. So maybe they don't have to get transported to a hospital if they're not severely ill, yep. you know, we'll still respond if we have to, of course. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of, a uh, lot of, a lot of talk about expanding that, um, you know, even looking at doing something uh, where people could get uh, a, a voucher to get an Uber ride to the hospital instead of an ambulance to keep our ambulances in service as best we can. But that's still in the, in the works. You know, they're working through the city uh, fiscal folks to see if we could get some of that done uh, for people that are not severely ill um, so we don't tie up the ambulances. So uh, we're, we're trying a couple of different things than what we did in the first wave. We have ambulances coming in from outside the 
the city again uh, the, through this national ambulance contract. They're supposed to come in this weekend. I think we have 50 units coming in, 35 BLS, uh, 15 ALS. We had 100 last year in the first wave. But as you know, this is going on all over the country. So we were surprised we were able to get these additional resources. But our fire companies are out there doing the medical runs as well. Um, and uh, we're doing the best we can, you know, under the circumstances. And uh, like I tell everybody, we just got to remain calm. We're the professionals, man. We got to do the best we can. Absolutely. And send your son my best, even though he's not. Thankfully, he's not feeling too terribly. Yeah, uh, yeah, we you. certainly hope that uh, he's, he'll feel much better in the coming days. And all the FDNY out there right now that's doing this job, it's a hard job as it is. Add in the pandemic and it makes it even harder. Thank you. And keep doing what you do. And to our NYPD friends as well, same thing. Keep doing what you do. And our Chief, healthcare workers, the folks yep, in the you hospital. Can't thank you. I, I, I didn't want to omit them either. They're, thank uh, you. They're, they are true heroes, man. The doctors mm -hmm. and nurses and all of those folks. Tremendous people. All of our essential workers, you know, thank you for what you've been doing throughout these last couple of years. You know, it's been a great effort on your part under some very difficult circumstances. Well, Chief, this has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it immensely. It is now time for the concluding segment of the show. It is called Rapid Fire. Five hit and run questions for me, five answers for you. Are you ready? Go. First, besides the roof rescue in 89, most uplifting job you ever responded to? Probably a job in Queens when I was in the squad when one of my firefighters made a rescue of a young girl, a uh, pretty serious fire, and he got a he got a medal for that too. Uh, his name was Greg Haynes, one awesome. of the best firefighters I ever worked with. Second, funniest call you ever responded to? That was a medical call. Uh, when I was the captain of Engine Two Three Four, we went to a. I tell the story all the time. Actually, it's so funny you ask that question. And we we got to the uh, door of the apartment and. Knocked on the door. A woman comes to the door, says, it's my uh, nephew. He's not feeling good. And, uh, okay, you know, the ambulance is on the way. Where is he? And he was walking around. And I think he had maybe uh, been uh, partaking in some uh, extracurricular activity of some sort. And he was that kind of out of it. He was kind of a teenage kind of kid, an older teenager. And he was walking around his underwear. And uh, he took a chair in the middle of his living room. And he, uh, he went to the bathroom on the floor. Not great. Not, Not great, great, Bob. It wasn't good. It was. Yeah. It, it was. It, it was funny after the fact. Let's just put it that way. But it was the. That was the most memorable, if not the funniest after the fact, because I often talk about it with guys. Do you remember that, met at EMS run we went on? It was pretty crazy. It was crazy. You couldn't pay me enough for that. You could not. As soon as somebody does it, all right, I'm up. Been nice knowing you all. Yeah. <laughs> Third, funniest colleagues you ever worked with. Oh man! Wow. Mike Esposito, Rescue 2. Tommy Bone. Tommy Bone was one of my guys in Squad 270, wound up becoming a lieutenant uh, in uh, Rescue. Um, he passed away. He had a motorcycle accident and uh, had a really bad head injury, uh, succumbed to his injuries a period of time later. Tommy Bone and Mike Esposito probably, and uh, a guy named Mad Dog, Tom Lordesina, my first company, Engine 227. Those were the three funniest guys I think I ever worked with. Fourth, favorite bar or restaurant in New York City? Hmm. It just closed, actually. Uh, Donovan's. Hmm. It just closed in Bayside, Queens. But there's another one in, in, in uh, Woodside. But Donovan's was one of my favorites. Fifth and finally, you've been a part of a lot of promotion ceremonies, and you kind of gave us a glimpse of what you tell these men and women as you're promoting them. But nonetheless, I'll ask you, what advice would you give a young firefighter coming on the job now? You have to be a student of the business, be a student of the job. That's what I tell people all the time. So when you come on the job, you have to continually stay in the game. You know, you get your training, uh, but it's all about a little personal responsibility. Uh, become and stay a student of the business, a student of the job. There are more resources out there today than anywhere uh, via the Internet and all these different websites. So uh, you can stay on top of your game. Even when you're not going to fires and emergencies, uh, you could always be on top of your game if you take the time to do it. So become a student and stay a student of the job. Well, Chief, I thank you immensely for coming on. Don't say goodbye yet. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. But before we, before we sign off uh, from the show, are there any shout outs you want to give? I'm going to give a shout out to uh, all of my brothers and sisters out in the field. 
uh, that uh, are doing this job each and every day. I have the uh, utmost respect for the work that you do each and every day. I'm, uh, I'm in awe of the work that our folks do. I miss it. You know, I haven't been on the fire floor in quite a long time, but uh, what I see being done out there each and every day is just tremendous. And uh, I love them all, and uh, I'm proud to be the chief. Uh, my shout out is to the FPNY, all the current members and all the retired members who have made the time to come on this show and share their stories. You're the first current member I've interviewed, uh, which is cool. And I thank you immensely. Uh, thank you for what you've done in the past and what you're still doing now. Um, it's great to talk with you guys and I'm honored to get a glimpse of what the operations are like every day. You know, I've often said the FDNY is the greatest fire department in the world. The NYPD is the greatest police department in the world. And I get to talk to both uh, uh, amazing, amazing people from both amazing departments. My second shout out is to Amanda Farinacci. She helped set up this interview. She's the press secretary formerly of New York One. Amanda, thank you so much. Uh, you've made this a really easy process and this was a really, really fun time. And I wanna get you on the show too. She has a very interesting story to tell in her own right. So Amanda, if you're listening, come on the show. I wanna have you on the show. So I worked uh, with Amanda's father and her brother. Oh, really? You yes, did? I did. Uh, no kidding, no kidding. Oh yeah, because I, I remember, yeah, she's uh, her family has a great rich history in the fire service, that's yep. true. That's true. So hopefully she can come on the show in a short order in her own right. Thanks again, Amanda. Much, much appreciated. Uh, coming up on the Mike DeMaven podcast, he was one of the original foreign counterterrorism liaisons. He went to Israel when Ray Kelly created the NYPD's Counterterrorism Bureau. He investigated bombings over there, prevented bombings over there, and got intelligence back to New York and the NYPD in real time. He's an author as well. His name is Mordecai Janansky, retired detective, and he'll join me Monday night at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a show about his career. Believe me, you don't want to miss that one. In the meantime, on behalf of Chief of Department Thomas Richardson, I am Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Stay safe, everybody, Stay safe, everybody with the snow, and uh, take care.